Hi, my name is Drew, and I'm going to be walking you through the RPOD 190 today. Uh, starting right up front, we're going to go over the coupling and uncoupling procedure. Uh, what you have right up here at the front of the, of the tongue is going to be your coupler mechanism. As it sits here, this is going to be the unlocked position, straight up in the air. Uh, when we go ahead and latch this back, that's going to be the locked position. Now, it is very important that when we are in this locked position, we are making sure that this secondary latch is fully engaged. Uh, anytime we go ahead and lock it back, go ahead and give it a, a firm pull up and make sure it is fully engaged here. Uh, so this is going to be the starting position. We're, of course, going to raise the electric tongue jack, uh, raising the tongue up, the coupler up uh, three inches above your ball and drop. We're going to go ahead and center that ball and drop underneath the coupler, uh, allow that jack to go ahead and, and place that in that down position. And then once we are fully seated, we're again going to pull that all the way back Go ahead and check in and make sure that we are truly locked in. We can then go ahead and pin this coupler uh, with a secondary uh, pin if we were inclined to do so to keep it from potentially uh, rattling loose going down the road. Uh, it's just a secondary added uh, safety feature. Of course, it is something that I do recommend. Um, once we are fully locked in here, we can go ahead and run the jack all the way up into the resting position until it stops. We're then going to go ahead and take your toe chains here. We're going to cross those underneath the coupler, hooking those onto the receiver like so. It is very important that we not only cross the, cross the chains underneath the coupler, but we also allow enough room to make our left and right hand turns. Uh, we want to skate the line of having enough room to make our turns, but not so much room that these make contact with the pavement. It is illegal in the state of Texas for these chains to make contact with the pavement, pavement at any time. Uh, also, it is state law that they do need to be cross so we do want to make sure we're doing both of those things uh, also riding right next to these chains is going to be your emergency breakaway cable here now this is essentially your last line of defense if these other tow components were to fail as the two vehicles separate it's going to pull this from that box like a rip cord essentially locking up the electric brakes it's very important that we do have a separate connection point on the receiver so whether that be a carabiner or quick link whatever you have this is going to be riding right next to those tow chain hooks and again, same rule of thumb, enough room to effectively make your turns left and right, but not so much room that it drags on the pavement. We have your seven-way receptacle here, uh, your seven-way plug, I should say. This is going to plug into the corresponding receptacle on the bumper. Uh, generally, this tab's going to be in the up position, but you'll, you'll just line that up. This is going to give you feel, full, uh, full function to your vehicle's charging system, braking system, lights, things like this things like that. Anytime this is plugged into the bumper of your vehicle, think of it at that point in time as one large vehicle. Uh, for all intents and purposes, uh, it is linked together. Hopping up here to your electric tongue jack. Uh, we have a light there. Uh, gives you an excellent point of reference if you are backing up to the unit at dark. Also doing any coupling or uncoupling after dark, that's going to help you light your way there. Uh, clear marked up or down operation here on the electric switch. Very easy. Uh, does make loading and unloading very easy. Uh, underneath this plug here, we're going to find the manual drive. Uh, we'll go ahead and use this corresponding crank handle to go ahead and move and maneuver that jack up or down. Again, in the event that we have a power loss situation, uh, jack's not functioning properly, something along those lines, uh, we can still uh, load and unload the unit uh, and take it to a service facility if need be. Uh, directly behind that, we have a 20-pound propane tank. This is the same variant you're going to find on any gas grill. Up top here, we have your service valve. Uh, when it does come to uh, maintaining the tank, turning it, uh, getting, t removing it to get it filled, we're, of course, going to turn it off here. We're going to remove the uh, pigtail here, loosen the tension band. That will allow us to go ahead and lift the tank out and, of course, take it to get serviced, uh, filled, any of those things. Uh, this is all covered by that black propane cover we see there on the floor. Uh, if we orientate this so that the uh, door is facing the rear, you're going to find a hole here. Uh, we're just going to line that hole up here with this stud. Once that stud's protruding, we're then going to put this wing nut on that's going to go ahead and hold that uh, cover into place. That's just to protect the, uh, the propane tank from any damage uh, going down the road, any rocks, uh, keep the weather off the tank, things like that. Directly behind that, we have your interstate D-cycle battery. Uh, maintenance is very important with these lead-acid batteries. 
What that's going to entail for you is two or three times a year, we're going to pull these vent panels. Uh, we're going to inspect the water level and refill with distilled water as necessary. Uh, also, not a bad idea since the unit does not come standard with a battery disconnect switch. Uh, not a bad idea to physically disconnect these battery terminals. Uh, again, for periods of long-term storage, it's going to keep any nominal or phantom draws off of that battery system. Uh, moving on here to the uh, side of the unit, uh, we have stabilizer jacks on all four corners. Uh, now, these jacks are for stabilization. They're not for leveling. So leveling front to back is going to be done with the tongue jack up front here. Leveling from left to right is going to be done with the tires and your choice of a leveling kit. Once you are fairly certain of your level, you're going to then run these jacks down. Uh, very easy to do. You're going to use the corresponding crank handle, and that is a three-quarter inch drive nut. Uh, we're just going to go ahead and place that on the drive nut, and we either we come down, make contact with the pavement, maybe a quarter turn more just to sure everything up. Same on the way up. Uh, you, do not, you do not need to go overly tight with these. Uh, they will stay in better shape longer if you kind of use a light touch. They don't work themselves down uh, or anything like that. So uh, something to keep in mind there. Uh, we have your six gallon capacity water heater here. Um, it is dual source, runs on 110 volt electricity or it also runs on propane with uh, 12 volt ignition. Uh, maintenance is very important. Anytime the unit is going to be in storage for more than seven days, it is very important that we do go ahead and drain the water heater separate of the system. Uh, in this particular location, we have your low point drains here as well. So I'm going to go ahead and kind of uh, explain that uh, all together essentially. So uh, purging all the water from the system is going to be done in, with the low point drains as well as the water heater here. Uh, so start out with your low point drains. You have some valves there on each side of them. So we would go ahead and open up those low point drains. Uh, just FYI, low point drains are the lowest point in the unit's plumbing. Everything's going to be drained via uh, all the in-between plumbing. So everything in between water source and fixture is going to be drained with your low point drains here. Uh, once we've drained that, uh, we can go ahead up here to the, uh, excuse me, up here to the water heater. And it's very important from a safety standpoint that we follow it the correct series of steps uh, when we do drain that. Of course, we're going to give it ample time to cool down, at least two or three hours generally. Uh, once we are fairly certain of the temperature, it is very important that we depressurize it. Uh, we can use any fixture within the unit to depressurize it. And of course, we're going to focus on the hot side of that fixture. So if we cut the inflow of water to the unit, we can then go to any fixture within the unit, turn that hot side of the spigot on, that's going to go ahead and depressurize the water heater. Uh, once we don't see any water coming from that fixture anymore, that's our indicator that the water heater has been depressurized. We can come here with an inch and a sixteenth uh, socket and ratchet and go ahead and back that drain plug out. The remaining four to five gallons of water are going to evacuate the uh, tank from that location. Now this is not only a drain plug, but that is also your anode rod. What an anode rod is, is it acts like a magnet for hard water deposits, calcification, things like that. Um, they deposit onto that anode rod as opposed to the inside of the water heater. It is a consumable part. Expect to get a year or two in between anode rod changes. Uh, other than that, uh, manufacturer does recommend that you prime the water heater or pump six gallons of water into the water heater before lighting it. Uh, again, we're going to use any fixture within the unit, and again, we're going to focus on the hot side. Uh, this time, we're going to introduce a flow of water into the unit itself, and then we're going to go ahead and turn that hot side of that spigot on. Initially, that flow is going to be very airy, very interrupted. Uh, what it's doing is it's working the air out from the water heater itself and replacing it with water. So once that flow normalizes, once there's no... Uh, again, no spitting or, or bubbling of the water. That generally is our indicator that we do have six gallons of water into the water heater. We can go ahead and choose our sources um, on how we want to heat that water. Uh, now, it does come to choosing your source. Here on the outside uh, or exterior of the water heater, you have an on-off toggle switch. Now, that's going to control the electric heating element within the unit, uh, and this is where you're going to turn that electric heating element on and off. I find the problem with this location of the switch is that a lot of my customers forget uh, that they have it turned on. They'll go ahead and drain it 
uh, the procedure we just talked to. And if there is power introduced to the unit, it is going to start heating an empty tank, which is, is something we want to avoid. Uh, if we're running it off of propane with 12-volt ignition, that's going to be done there on the inside. We're going to get to that switch when we, of course, get to the inside of the unit. Uh, last recommendation here for the water heater is going to be protecting it from the intrusion of mud divers and flying insects. You're going to do that by screening these uh, louvers in this uh, grating off uh, further. Uh, mud divers in particular are attracted to the smell of propane. What they do is they crawl as deep within the appliance as they can, make their dirt nest uh, again as deep within the appliance as they can. Generally we're going to leave things inoperable or at least not, not allow the appliance to run as efficiently as it should. Uh, biggest thing with that is going to be prevention. It is very expensive in hindsight to go ahead and get those uh, nests cleaned out and things like that. Uh, that not only goes for the water heater here, but that goes for all of your propane appliances, your furnace, your refrigerator, things like that. Um, we have your potable water fill here. Now that's how we're going to fill that onboard water tank. We're going to stick a drinking water hose directly into that orifice. We're going to fill it up to it overflows. Uh, once it overflows, we of course cap it off here. And we do need to use that onboard 12 volt water pump to draw that water up from the tank to the fixtures and make it usable. This is going to be your off-grid or your potable water option. Uh, if we're in the capacity of an RV park, we're going to go ahead and use this city water connection. Uh, now it is very important with this city water connection that we, we, we regulate that pressure. Uh, these units are designed to have a working water pressure in be anywhere in between 40 and 75 PSI. We include a water pressure regulator with your purchase. Uh, this specific water pressure regulator is going to regulate it between 40 and 50 PSI. Generally, that's good enough for most people's needs, but if you uh, prefer a higher water pressure, you can always upward up that to, again, upwards of 75 PSI. I would not exceed that 75 PSI recommendation. No matter the water pressure regulator, go ahead and hook that as close to the water source as you can. And then, of course, your hose onto that. And lastly, going to be your uh, other side of your hose onto the trailer connection like so. So very standard stuff. Uh, again, this is going to be your, your, your RV park uh, option or anywhere that you do have access to full-time running water. If we go ahead and, and, and uh, take a look down low here, we have your freshwater holding tank, and we do see the drain there. That's just going to be a, a half-inch plug there on that, uh, the bottom of that tank. It is gravity-fed, so when it does come to drain it, we're just going to remove that plug. Uh, low point drains here, we already talked about those, but uh, maybe a better look for those. Uh, also underneath the door here, we have your uh, sewage hose storage there. Uh, that, does a, that does run the full width of the camper, does have a door on either side. Uh, will just about accommodate any size sewage hose. Uh, we have your furnace here. Uh, we talked about the importance of screening that off for mud divers and flying insects, things like that. Uh, other than that, it's an exhaust vent. Make sure you let it exhaust. Uh, you want to want to, you know, put a lawn chair up in front of it or restrict the flow in any way. Give it room to breathe. Uh, that's generally it. Uh, also, when we're talking about um, these units in general, it's very important to talk about maintenance. Uh, here, since we are at the slide out, let's go ahead and talk about slide out maintenance. Um, what you're looking for with the slide out, uh, every 90 days we're going to go ahead and lubricate these tracks. Uh, now you have these tracks top to bottom, of course, uh, and left to right. Uh, it is very important that we lubricate all four tracks using a dry silicone lubricant, a PTFE silicone lubricant. Uh, we are then going to go ahead and run that slide in and out a few times uh, to distribute the product, and then we're going to be good for the next 90 days. Also on that same maintenance schedule, we want to go ahead and use a um, seal conditioner here on these seals. These seals do wrap the full, uh, you know, wrap all the way around the unit. And again, it is very important uh, that we use an RV grade seal conditioner. We're going to go ahead and spray them down. Uh, generally, the directions on those cans are going to be letting it sit for a, a certain amount of time, wiping off any excess, and then of course you're good for the next 90 days. Now don't forget, you not only have a set of seals here, but you also have a set of seals on the inside because that slide does seal in both directions. So you'll want to go ahead and make sure you are treating both sets of seals. Uh, also, it's a good time to talk about the, the, the whole structural kind of uh, maintenance as well. And you're, you're going to, because you're going to be on that 90 day maintenance schedule with that as well, 
Uh, here on the body, anywhere where two pieces come together, they're going to go ahead and uh, be, there's going to be some sort of sealant. And in this case here, what we're looking at is going to be a 100% silicone product. Uh, we're looking for any degradation in those seals, any gapping, any cracking, any peeling, any of that stuff we want to, of course, catch uh, as soon as possible to stop any water intrusion. Uh, there on the roof, we're going to still be on that same 90-day maintenance schedule. We're going to use a slightly different product. It's going to be a 100% or it's going to be a self-leveling lap sealant. Uh, and again, we're going to touch up any areas where we do see any degradation, things like that. Generally, you're going to source both of those products from your RV dealer or parts house. Uh, we have tire pressure and lug nuts down here. Uh, now, lug nuts have been torqued to 100 foot-pounds here uh, in the shop. Manufacturer recommends a very important retorque procedure. The initial 15, 25, 50, and 100 miles of travel, we need to stop and we need to retorque those down to 100 foot-pounds. Manufacturer further recommends that at the start of each trip there on after, we do want to go ahead and check that they are uh, again, maintaining that 100 foot-pounds of torque. Uh, now, with all trailer tires, you're going to want to run them at the, the, the uh, excuse me, the max tire pressure rating. That's going to be stamped on the sidewall of the tire as you would normally find it uh, with any automotive tire or anything else. That's not only stamped on the sidewall of the tire, but it is also going to be on the data tag here for this particular unit that's going to be 65 PSI. And again, that 65 PSI is kind of the magic number whether you are completely full or completely empty in terms of weight, that 65 PSI is going to be the magic number, so just keep that in mind. Uh, down low here, uh, we have your sewer outlet connection. Uh, now this specifically is going to be for your black water. Uh, black water is going to be anything that comes from the toilet, so what we're looking at there is going to be solid body waste. Uh, a couple rules of thumb with that, it is very important that no matter if we are hooked up to full-time septic, it is very important that we keep that black water valve in the closed position. As it sits now, it is going to be in the closed position. To open it, it's going to be a six inch pull towards the front of the camper. The reason why we want to keep it in the closed position, it is very important that we keep that solid, that solid body waste in as wet or flowing condition as we can. Uh, only way to do that is, of course, keep that in the closed position. Now your sewage hose is going to connect the very same way that cap comes off. You have four prongs along the outside of the tube and your sewage hose as well as the cap is going to have a keyhole. We're going to put that keyhole in the halfway position and give it a, a quarter inch turn. That's going to go ahead and lock it on. Uh, we also have your gray water a little further down from the camper, a little further down here. Uh, very similar in design. As we can see, we have that valve in the open position. That's what it's going to look like in the open position. That would be closed. Same rule of thumb with that though. Of course, you're not, you don't have those same restrictions in terms of uh, keeping the valve closed because you, you're not running with solid body waste or anything like that in there. Uh, but it is a good rule of thumb to go ahead and keep that closed uh, when possible. Uh, that way you can go ahead and use that gray water to rinse any shared plumbing. Uh, not really a huge thing in this scenario, but it could also rinse your sewage hose on the way out uh, after dumping that black water tank there. Now, kind of backtracking a little bit, we have up here on the slide out, we have your refrigerator vents here. Uh, again, very, very large intrusion point for mud divers and flying insects. Very important that we do screen these openings here on both of these top and bottom vents. Uh, now, this is a three-way refrigerator. All your controls are going to be done from right inside the unit. Only other thing to do other than protecting this from the intrusion of mud divers and flying insects is going to be go ahead and giving this a visual inspection a couple times a year. Uh, again, just confirming that nothing's gotten in. Uh, make sure there's no frayed wires, frayed lines, anything like that. So just give it a visual inspection. If it looks good to you, it's probably going to be in good service. Uh, also here on the slide, we have an outside shower. Uh, nothing too earth shattering here. We have access to hot and cold water on off there on the head to go ahead and conserve your water supply. This all kind of wraps around these valves here and stores in that compartment. Again, nothing too crazy. Uh, most campers do have an outside shower. Uh, and they are very, all are very similar in design. Uh, also underneath the slide, we have your 30 amp, 110 volt power supply. Now this is only gonna plug into the unit one way. If we go ahead and look here at the plug, we're gonna have one L-shaped prong, and then we have an L-shaped prong here. We go ahead and line everything up properly, give it an eighth inch turn to the right, that locks it in. 
Then we do have this secondary collar here. We can screw down, lock it in further. Uh, keep anybody from potentially tripping on it, something like that. Uh, for every unit that I deliver, it is very important that we talk, uh, that we, we add a surge protector in line, a 30 amp surge protector. There's a lot going on in, in these units electronically. Uh, and RV parks in general are kind of known to have substandard or kind of used and abused wiring. Uh, so it is very important, again, that we do, uh, you know, it is really the number one thing we can do to protect our investment. If you have any questions on, um, you know, what's, what products to buy or, or further the importance of buying one, feel free to give our parts department a call. They'd be more than happy to go ahead and walk you through the importance uh, of that product and, and educate you on which might be your best option. Uh, also, we do include a 30 to 15 amp reducer with the unit. It's a little puck style reducer. Uh, works well for, for you know, testing some low draw appliances, you know, testing function of lights, things like that. Uh, pre cooled in your refrigerator is also a popular option. Uh, that works great for those, the, again, those low draw appliances. If you want to run the air conditioner or do anything more uh, than what we just spoke of, feel free to upgrade that 30 to 15 amp reducer to a dog bone style reducer. Uh, that is just separated by about 12 inches worth of cord. What it's going to do is going to dissipate heat a whole lot better, uh, keep things kind of, uh, you know, in a lot better shape uh, and flowing better. Uh, moving on, we have your storage compartment here. Uh, with all storage compartments uh, within the unit, they have that magnetic hold open, which is a great feature. Uh, and this is a very large, uh, full wraparound storage compartment. This is all accessible from underneath the dinette as well. Uh, here on the back side of the unit, of course, we have a full-size spare here. Uh, stabilizer jacks down low, tail lights, marker lights, uh, nothing too, too crazy. Uh, when it does come to changing a tire, it's important enough to note uh, jack placement and things like that. Uh, what that's going to entail for you is, uh, of course, the unit does not come with its own jack, so you're going to use the jack that is uh, with your vehicle. Uh, once you go ahead and, uh, again, in the event of a flat tire, we're going to put that jack directly on the axle as close to the tire as you can without it interfering in your work. We're gonna go ahead and do our business, safely lower that back down, and of course that's gonna work out well for you. Um, again, nothing too crazy. We have the other side of that storage compartment here. Uh, kind of the usual suspects, as I call it, assist, uh, uh, assist handle here. Uh, locks in the out position. Uh, can either be folded against the door, folded against the window, whatever your choice. Uh, steps are going to be up and in. Again, nothing too, too crazy out of the realm here. Uh, we have your black tank flush here. It's uh, important to note here that this is uh, designed to help blast off any compound or toilet waste, body waste, things of that nature from the inside of the tank. Uh, now, there is no check valve uh, with this. So what that means is if you allow water to rush in there indefinitely, the path of least resistance is the rooftop septic vents. What's going to happen is it's going to overflow that tank, effectively overflowing those rooftop septic vents and uh, you know, raining waste down on top of you. As horrific as that sounds, it can easily be avoided. Uh, I recommend my customers no more than five minutes with water rushing in here before running over to the other side and relieving the pressure there at the black water valve. Uh, if you think you're going to go ahead and forget what you're doing, get sidetracked, whatever, uh, go ahead and leave that black water valve in the open position. That's going to keep that from potentially overflowing at all. Uh, a couple 110 volt all weather outlets, uh, nothing too crazy there. Again, just some 15 amp outlets. Uh, speakers, lights, awning, all those controls are going to be from the inside. Uh, we'll, get, we'll get eyes on those switches. Uh, again, they're on the inside. Uh, you have a a quick connect sprayer hose here designed to kind of be used with this outside kitchen. Uh, you slide the locking collar back that's going to allow you to connect or disconnect and then when connecting you go ahead and put the, the mail in fully. That's once you're fully inserted it's going to go ahead and lock on. That's the same kind of idea or premise for the cooktop here. Uh, of course this is going to be your line uh, to do that. Uh, you have a quick connect here for the stovetop that's going to be there on the underside. And um, yep, right there. So we would just do the same thing, press that in fully, it's gonna lock there. And then we're gonna come over here uh, to this one here on the side of the frame and do the very same thing. Uh, now only difference with these ones is, I don't know if you can see this, you have a valve here. Uh, we're gonna need to turn that valve on just like when it, with any valve. 
if you're with the flow, you're on, against the flow, you're off. And then when we actually look at this side of the hose, uh, we have another valve there. Uh, now you cannot connect or disconnect when that valve is in the on position, so it is a, it is a uh, secondary safety feature uh, as well, so keep that in mind. Uh, that just about covers it here on the outside of this unit. We're going to go ahead and hop on the inside and start going over that stuff. So right here inside the door, uh, first uh, very important thing we have here is going to be your fire extinguisher. Uh, we not only want to test your fire extinguisher every time before taking the unit out, but we want to go ahead and test all of your safety equipment. Uh, what that's going to entail is your smoke alarm as well as your carbon monoxide uh, LP leak detector. Testing the fire extinguisher here, we're going to go ahead and press that test tab down. If it goes ahead and springs back, that means we have um, pressure in the unit. If it were to stay depressed, we need to go ahead and pull this out and replace it. Uh, also down low here, we have your fuse panel breaker box here. Uh, everything we see there on the left side of that panel is going to be your uh, 110 volt light switch style uh, resettable breaker there. Everything there on your right is going to be your automotive blade style fuses. Those are replaceable. It's my recommendation to go ahead and keep a few spares with the unit in the event that you need them. Uh, everything in terms of function is going to be marked right there on the door. Uh, is a de uh, press dead center to go ahead and open and close that. Uh, so coming up from there, uh, a couple 110 volt outlets, of course, that's powering the television in this scenario. You also have a couple 12 volt USB ports there uh, to charge any uh, devices, excuse me, that are USB driven. Uh, TV uh, is easy on off switch here on the side. It does have a remote, uh, it does function, you know, very much like you'd expect. Uh, this I do not believe is on a, uh, it's not on a swivel. So this is your only central location, although you do have some auxiliary hookups uh, in the bedroom or the bed area if you wanted to add a secondary TV there. Uh, also up top here, we get your main light uh, cluster here. This is going to control most of your lights, uh, interior and exterior. So interior lights here, that's going to uh, control most of your overhead lights. Now want, with each of those lights, uh, they do have a button on the center, so you can really co effectively control which lights coming on coming on with this switch, uh, which is a pretty cool feature. Uh, porch light here, now this is gonna be the amber colored light on the exterior of the camper. I think we saw that, uh, you can't really, let me see here. You can see that coming on and off there on my hand. Um, next to that, we have your awning lights. These are gonna be the, the long string of LED lights there on the outside uh, of the awning, of course. Uh, that's on a lighted switch because when you uh, close that awning up, you can't effectively see those lights. If they were to get bumped in the on position, uh, you don't want them killing your battery or something like that. So it is nice to have that lighted, uh, that lighted switch. Uh, awning extend and retract is going to be here. Uh, we can see that kind of coming out. Um, and then, of course, that's going to be the in position there. Uh, slide room in and out. Uh, now what we have here with this unit is going to be the Schwintech system. Um, it, what that means for you is that it's two independently geared motors pushing that slide in and out. Uh, it is very important that we operate that properly. What that's going to entail is going to be coming fully in, fully out. Avoid short bursts, avoid halfway openings, things like that. Uh, we don't want to kind of put those uh, motors in an off position, effectively binding the slide in its opening. So come fully in, fully out. Uh, the slide system is equipped with an electric brake. So just hold that button until that slide stops in its place and then go ahead and release. Uh, we have your so, uh, Go Power uh, solar sticker here. What this is just telling you is that the unit is pre-wired for solar there up on the roof. Uh, if we were to go that extra mile and install solar into this unit, this is where your charge controller is gonna be mounted. Uh, this is where you would go ahead and cut out to go ahead and, and install that. Uh, and then we have your Fearon system here. This is going to uh, be Bluetooth, AM, FM, radio. You do have multiple inlets there, whether that's HDMI, uh, USB, 3.5 millimeter jack there. Uh, very user friendly, very easy to navigate around. Uh, one thing to be aware of is you do have two zones. They are labeled here, one and two. Um, or excuse me, I'm sorry, one and two up top here. Uh, and is, if one is going to be inside, of course, two is going to be outside. Pay attention to where you, or what zone you are broadcasting your music to uh, or whatever you're watching to. Uh, make sure you're not inadvertently uh, pushing something outside that you, you don't want to. Uh, here in the dinette area, of course, we have access to that storage compartment via this door here. 
uh, and from the top. So the tops underneath these cushions are removable and we can go down there and grab our gear. Now this also does make a secondary sleeping area as well. Uh, you have a double pedestal table here. So what you would do is you'd work this tabletop off of those uh, poles and then ultimately work that pole from the flange there on the floor. We're then gonna go ahead and take that tabletop and we're going to place it on these black bumpers here. Uh, once we've done so, we're gonna go ahead and remove this middle cushion here and we're gonna go ahead and use these two back cushions to go ahead and fill that space up uh, and allow it again as a secondary, seat, uh, secondary sleeping area. Uh, down low here, we have a couple 110 volt outlets. Uh, one thing to mention about these outlets is they are all, all on the same circuit. If one of them gets overloaded, the reset point is going to be in the bathroom. So we'll get eyes on that when we do get into the bathroom. Uh, but since we're here talking about it, uh, not a bad idea to bring up. Uh, again, nothing too crazy here. You have your sink, um, clearly marked hot and cold there on the fixture. Nothing too crazy. Kind of cool countertop extender, things like that. Uh, suburban cooktop here. Uh, a very basic kind of camping stove. Uh, set up here. What that's going to look like is you need to keep a long stem barbecue lighter with the unit. We would go ahead and turn this to light. Uh, once you turn this to light, that flow, that propane is flowing. You don't have to like push it down or anything. Uh, so be ready to light. Once you turn the knob, go ahead and put your uh, lighter, your flame directly on the burner and go ahead and, and, and light it that way. Uh, give it nice and ample time to cool down before closing the lid here. Uh, this isn't a griddle, this isn't a cooktop, it is just, again, a countertop extender to make uh, efficient use of this space when you're not uh, preparing a meal. Uh, windows, for the most part, are all going to be the same. Uh, in terms of window, uh, you have this locking uh, tab here. You go ahead and lift that up and go ahead and slide that out of the way. Uh, this is going to be a standard metal mini blind here on this window, uh, but on these windows, we have a, a pull-down friction uh, shade there. Uh, now as these age, the, the friction kind of loosens here on these strings. Uh, you can always retension them by loosening this screw, uh, pulling a few uh, inches of, of a slack through and going ahead and, and re-knotting it. That will go ahead and, and tighten that tension up there on the string. Um, down low here on the floor, we have your carbon monoxide LP leak detector here on this side. That is, a secondary, that is a second piece of safety equipment we've came to. That is wired into the 12-volt section of the camper. Uh, it does have indicators to you on which gas it may be sensing. Uh, and it is, does have a test button. And again, you're going to want to test that every time before taking the unit out. If we go ahead here and hop onto the other side of the aisle way, uh, we have your road vac. Uh, that's an excellent feature. You can, of course, uh, upgrade it with using the hose system here. Uh, again, that's going to be a, an upgrade. You're going to have to source from either uh, Forest River or RoadVac themselves. You have an on-off switch here, um, but you also do have access to that by opening this door here. Uh, idea being is that you could go ahead and sweep all your uh, floor debris uh, towards the appliance, opening up that door and just sweeping it in. Uh, now this does have a changeable bag. Uh, to go ahead and change that bag, you're gonna go ahead and remove this here. Uh, by doing so, you put your finger here in this hole and that allows you to go ahead and open it up. Of course, take note of the bag you need before throwing it away so you're making sure you're getting the right bag. Uh, coming up top here, we have your Dometic thermostat here. Uh, now this is a captive touch thermostat. What that means is we have one mode button here which is touch, uh, touch enabled. Uh, when going through here, the first thing we have to choose is our air conditioner fan speed. Uh, low or high means that fan's gonna run indefinitely whether it reaches that, core te that, that thermostat set temperature or not. Uh, if we go ahead here on auto, it's going to function very much like you would expect uh, where it's going to hit that temperature and then go ahead and, and, and shut down. Now we do have to choose a fan speed here even if our ultimate next selection is going to be furnace. So once we go ahead and select a fan speed, it's going to take us into the air conditioner mode there. Uh, it is noting that we are in that auto fan speed there at 72 degrees or that's, that's what we have it set to and we are in that air conditioner mode here. If we want to put that temperature up or down, we can use the up or down arrows here. If I hit that button one more time, it's going to take us into the furnace mode or heater mode. Uh, again, once it catches up with us, that air conditioner is going to power down. It's going to kick that blower motor on immediately. 16 seconds after that, it's actually going to ignite and start producing heat. Uh, in a unit of this size, it would not surprise me if this uh, propane burning furnace, which 
is underneath the bed in this particular floor plan uh, would, would happen to set off the smoke alarm. Uh, within that first 15 minutes of operation, the appliance is not running as efficiently as it soon will do. Uh, and they are known to, that that is a very common uh, happening is that uh, it will set off the smoke alarm. Uh, if that happens, don't, don't panic, just turn the uh, smoke alarm off. Again, that should dissipate within that 15 minutes of operation. So we're gonna go ahead and turn that off. Uh, now coming over here, we have your convenience center as well as your controls for your water heater and your water pump. If we go ahead and look here at the display panel, it's gonna not only tell us the, the charge of our battery, but also the level of full of our tanks. Uh, so battery's full, battery's gonna read full anytime we're plugged into shore power. To get an accurate readout of where our battery sits, we need to go ahead and unplug from the wall. Go ahead and hit uh, that button there and that's gonna give us a more realistic uh, gauge. Uh, fresh water is going to be full. This unit is full of water, so that's why that's reading full. Black water is empty, gray water is empty. Uh, switches down here, of course, we turn on your water pump switch. It's gonna pressurize that system. You know it's on because it's lighted. Uh, that's how we're going to be using the unit today. Uh, when you come pick up the unit, there's gonna be water in it. We have pressurized the system. That's what you're seeing there. Uh, water heater here. Now this water heater comes on. This fault light's gonna come on with the appliance. That What that is, is essentially your indicator on whether or not the water heater has lit or not. So you'll see that kind of come on and off while it's uh, cycling, doing its lighting cycle. Generally they'll cycle three times. If they do not light by the end of that third cycle, it stops trying, it keeps that fault light on, and that is your indicator that your water heater has not lit. Now the reason for it not to light is generally either the propane bottles uh, doesn't have any gas in it, uh, maybe the valve on top is closed, uh, or you know sometimes it just takes a, a more than a, a few seconds for that propane to travel through the line to the appliance. In the event that you come back five minutes later, that fault light's on, go ahead and check and make sure you have gas in the tank, make sure the valve's on. Uh, if that's the case, go ahead and turn it off, turn it back on. It's gonna cycle another three times uh, generally, if you've corrected the issue, it's going to light on the first try of the second cycle. Uh, we're going to hop back around here to check out the refrigerator and the microwave, and then we're going to go into the, uh, the bathroom here and check that out as well. Uh, you have a Dometic three-way refrigerator here. Uh, On-off button is going to be here all the way on the left. It'll go ahead and turn it on. It's going to go through its boot-up process and default to the last saved selection. Uh, of course, the plug means 110-volt electricity. Uh, very standard propane. Uh, the flame there is for the uh, propane gas. As you can see, it's, it's illuminating a fault light here. What that's saying is that it, it, it doesn't sense any flow of propane through the line, which would happen generally when you are lighting it. What I'm going to do here is if I push that button, it's going to start its lighting cycle again. And again, very much like the uh, water heater is, has a certain lighting cycle. Once it exceeds that lighting cycle, it's going to start indicating to you that it hasn't lit. Uh, to reset it or to, to get it to recycle again, you're just gonna push that button like I did there. And then we have your uh, DC option here. Now generally these ammonia absorption systems are very power hungry on DC. Uh, it's our opinion as a dealership to use uh, the utmost caution when operating this on uh, 12 volt. It's not something that uh, you, know, you, you wanna do without caution. It could leave you stranded. We find most of our customers are not overly pleased with the operation of this on 12 volt either way. Uh, when looking here inside the, the, um, the refrigerator, there's, you know, you get your, your removable freezer here uh, that does have a couple latches there on the bottom and instructions to go ahead and pull that out. Uh, you of course have the blue light. You have this little guy you can flip out that's going to keep the door from closing fully. Uh, the reason why you would do that is if you are storing the unit uh, we don't want it to be closed all the way to keep it from getting mildewy or, or stinky on the inside. Uh, so you just flip that out there. Uh, uh, one thing I did skip here is your, your temperature control. Uh, the more bars you see, the cooler it is, very standard, um, you know, something like that. Uh, high point convection three-way uh, microwave grill here. Uh, this thing is awesome. Uh, it's a convection oven. It's a standalone microwave as well as a grill. Uh, you have a heating element on the top. You can run it like a toaster oven. Again, a convection works very, very well uh, and functions are very much like a microwave. Uh, you control your modes here up top. 
uh, preheat temperatures, things like that. Again, very much like a microwave. If you know how to work a microwave, you can definitely work your way around this. Uh, coming here into the bathroom, um, you know, nothing too, too crazy here. Nothing too, too crazy here on the inside of the bathroom. Uh, we have your vent fan here. Uh, it should be in the locked position. Uh, you're going to go ahead and unlock it by pulling that down, allowing that to crank open. Now, it is very important that we do close it and lock it before going down the road. You have four fan speeds here on the actual unit itself. Uh, nothing too crazy with that. It is to uh, designed to exhaust any moisture uh, from taking a shower, things like that. But again, most importantly, we do need to close it and lock it before going down the road. Uh, I'd like to make the joke that it's something you generally only forget once because it's probably not going to be there when you get to where you're going. Uh, flush here on the toilet. So you have the pedal flush here. It'll be a light to press on the pedal to fill the toilet with water. Uh, full press to flush. Uh, you're going to want to use a single ply RV grade toilet paper as well as some chemical treatments as well. Uh, toilet to, or excuse me, toilet tissue dissolver, uh, as well as a deodorizing product. Again, I'm going to refer you to our parts department if you do need any education on which products are going to be best for the uh, septic system of this camper. Uh, light switch here, on off, uh, just like with any other light within the camper, it's going to be right there on the fixture as well. Uh, GFI outlet, that was referenced earlier as well. That is going to be the reset location for the receptacles uh, in the event that one would get overloaded. Um, you know, medicine cabinet here, nothing too crazy. Uh, we have your magnetic hold open here on the shower, uh, or magnetic uh, hold close, I should say, so which that's pretty cool too. Uh, shower head is going to be very standard of what you'd see in an RV on off on the actual head. Uh, that's going to help you conserve hot water or overall water consumption. Probably find yourself doing like a military navy style shower within with pretty much any of our units that we carry. Uh, again, in the event to conserve uh, your water consumption. Uh, other than that, again, nothing too uh, out of the realm or, or too crazy uh, that you're going to find there in the bathroom. It is very straightforward, uh, very user friendly. Uh, cabinet doors here. This is going to be your closet space. You have some storage here. Again, nothing uh, too, too crazy there. Um, smoke alarm above my head, although it was referenced before, this runs on a 9 volt battery just like at home. It's going to function just like what you're used to at home. It does have a test button. It is important that we do test it before going down the road. Um, you know, kind of usual stuff back here. One thing, uh, I'm going to switch places with Clint so he can get a shot of this and I'm going to kind of talk you through it. Uh, right there on the wall, you have a, a little red light and a button there. Uh, now that red light indicates that your antenna booster is on on the roof of this unit it has an omnidirectional digital over the air antenna uh, what that means is it's going to automatically search out the best digital over the air uh, signal and bring in uh, any programming that's going to be available with that signal so for that to work properly that red light needs to be on there's a button right beside that uh, red light to turn that on and off uh, now that goes for both so that red light, even though it's located here in the bedroom, that's going to, of course, control the TV uh, up front as well. So if you're looking for over-the-air programming, that red light needs to be on. Uh, of course, the rest of the controls in that area are going to be for setting up a TV in this back area as well. So, um, I think that just about covers it here on the inside of the RPOD 190. We hope you enjoyed the walkthrough. If you do have any questions... Uh, please don't hesitate to give us a call. Thank you.